once upon a time on the northern plains of Italy, there roamed a hero who went by the name of Romulus. You may have heard of him as the legendary founder of Rome, perhaps, but what's a strapping godlike young man to do once he's founded one of the world's greatest cities? One day, as he was travelling through the Po Valley, Romulus came upon a group of people who were struggling to defend their village from the fierce Gaelic tribes roaming the region. The people were in need of a strong leader, and Romulus knew just the man for the job. Himself. He gathered the people together and said, I will help you defend your village from these invaders, but we must build a great fortress to protect ourselves. The people thought this was such a great idea that they set to work building a mighty fortress immediately on the banks of the Po River. The people began to dream of a great city that could rival the power and glory of Rome itself. Romulus, who had been a beloved leader of the people, heard their dreams and knew that he could help them achieve their goal. He said to them, If we are to build a great city, we must first establish a strong foundation. We must build our city upon the principles of justice, wisdom and strength. And so the people of the village began to build their city. They laid the foundation stones with great care and constructed a wall around the city to protect it from invaders. Romulus oversaw the construction and he ensured that the city was built to the highest standards possible. As the city grew, Romulus knew that it needed a name. He looked out over the fertile fields of the Po Valley and saw the bright flames of the forges that dotted the landscape. He turned to the people and said, We shall call this city Cremona, which means to burn, for it is the fires of our forges that will light the way to our greatness. And so the city of Cremona was born. It grew to become a powerful centre of trade and culture in northern Italy and was revered by many as a shining example of the principles of justice, wisdom and strength that Romulus had taught them. And this is the legend of how Romulus founded the city of Cremona. Hello and welcome to The Violin Chronicles, a podcast in which I, Linda Lesbe, will attempt to bring to life the story surrounding famous, infamous or just not very well known, but interesting violin makers of history. I'm a violin maker and restorer. I graduated from the French Violin Making School some years ago now, and I currently live and work in Sydney with my husband Antoine, who is also a violin maker and graduate of the French school, l'École Nationale de Lutry in Mircourt. As well as being a luthier, I've always been intrigued with the history of instruments I work with, and in particular, the lives of those who made them. So often when we look back at history, I know that I have a tendency to look at just one aspect, but here my aim is to join up the puzzle pieces and have a look at an altogether fascinating picture. So join me as I wade through tales not only of fame, famine and war, but also of love, artistic genius, revolutionary craftsmanship, determination, cunning and bravery that all have their part to play in the history of the violin. Welcome back to the story of Andrea Armati's two boys, the Armati brothers. In the last episode, we left them after they split the workshop and Antonio went off to set up on his own, leaving Girolamo with the house and shop to continue alone. The Amati brothers stopped working together in 1588, but if you remember the episodes on Gasparo de Salo over in Brescia, you would realise that their Brescian competition was still working away and in 1580, eight years earlier, a future employee of de Salo's was born his name was Gio Paolo Magini, and he would go on to become a roaring success. Girolamo Amati, however, had other things on his mind. As I mentioned earlier, his first wife, Lucrezia, had died shortly after having their daughter Elizabeth, and his new wife, Laura, had a full house to look after and a famine looming on the horizon. Girolamo in this decade made some beautiful instruments, including the one played by Ilya Izakovich in the Australian Chamber Orchestra. 
the Barang Nup violin and a painted violin for the French King Henry IV, to name a few. Girolamo was now in his late 30s and Laura was pregnant again. The news wasn't good. The Po River was rising and the plains around Cremona were flooding. The crops would be ruined again, like they had last year. The grain yields were a third of the previous years and outbreaks of typhus were hitting the rural areas, affecting those who grew the grain, and the disease was even worse in the heavily populated cities. After several years of bad weather, flooding and storms, the cities were deeply in debt from having to buy grain from abroad. For the next two years, matters only got worse. News was coming from other cities on the Po Plains. Bologna had expelled the so-called useless mouths, people without citizenship, beggars, jobless foreigners, and even those who were employed but not highly skilled in a trade. They were saying that it was to reserve the scant food supplies and to prevent overcrowding and outbreaks of epidemics. The governing bodies in the cities were afraid that the poor would revolt and steal the little food that was left in the city's reserves. But the people from rural areas where the crops were spoiled were flocking to the cities where they knew there were grain stores. Four-fifths of the population lived in rural areas but would be turned away at the city gates. Bologna was 150 kilometres from Cremona. The same could happen here. Already, 10,000 people had died in that city and 30,000 in the surrounding countrysides. In just 10 years, Cremona had gone from a boom to simply struggling to stay afloat. In 1594 and 1597, there was a famine and an economic downturn in the region. And it was also the year Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was premiered. Throughout these lean years, Girolamo was still making beautiful instruments, violas, violins and cellos. His choice of materials were of the finest standard and so was his workmanship. The sound quality of his instrument differed as well from that of his competition in Brescia. But he was keeping afloat and even had a recent order for a set of instruments for the chapel of the new King of France, Henry IV who had managed to survive the religious wars by converting to Catholicism, saying famously that Paris was worth a mass. Paris vaut bien une messe. This new set of instruments were to be decorated with the coat of arms and in Latin gold leaf read King Henry IV by the grace of God, King of France and Navarre. I speak to Benjamin Hebert about the authenticity of the Amati Charles IX instruments and musicians at this time, which is the end of Catherine de' Medici's reign and the beginning of Henry of Navarre's reign. Well, I think Catherine de' Medici is in France is just such a, a huge influence. Uh, Charles IX is a is a is a, uh, a child king and really has no power, and then he dies, is sickly, and then his brother, who's, who had become king of Poland, is brought back, and his, he becomes Henry IV, and then Catherine de' Medici dies in the, I'm going to say 1587, I know I'm wrong, uh, but around about that time, there's a wonderful quote about, you know, people would give a give more regard to a dead goat than they would to Catherine de' Medici. It was there was a point at which her power was over. Uh, Henry is assassinated within a year of her death, and Henry of Navarre, who is a Protestant, a, a Huguenot, comes in and becomes becomes king. And at that time, I think what we have to consider is that, you know, so right up until right up until the end of the Valois dynasty. You know, it's all Catherine de, it's all about Catherine de Medici. It's all about her. It's all about her triumphs and her successes. And then one of the things that happens, there's been actually sort of various musicologists have speculated that the Andrea Martis aren't, aren't authentic. And one of the reasons is that the earliest French orchestral music is for a completely different orchestration than these Italian instruments offer. And what I think, when you look at these things, the the propaganda of the painting all over them is very specific to the Valois. The Valois were hated. Uh, they massacred enough Huguenots to be really, really hated. Uh, when Henry comes in, he's set, you know, they're played by Italian musicians. They're playing music in every corner of the court. 
their eyes and ears which are open for Catherine de Medici there there's not a lot of difference between a spy and a musician in the 16th century and there's you know right the way through spies and musicians are kind of the same things because they're the people who can pay attention to what other people are doing they don't have any other agenda so all of that's expelled i think these things get get you know stuck in a cupboard somewhere and from the point that henry of navarre comes in so if we if we only think of them in you know in the perspective of Catherine de Medici, then of, then of course it makes sense. And then as things started to look a little better on the famine front, the sun poked its head out from behind the clouds, so to speak. On a cold winter's night in December 1596, Girolamo and Laura had their sixth child, Niccolo. His parents were probably just hoping he would survive the winter and his infancy, but Niccolo would not only survive he would go on to change the course of violin-making history forever. I know that sounds rather dramatic, but he does. He really does. While Niccolo Armati was busy being a baby, 60 kilometres away, a fellow Cremonese citizen, the talented composer and accomplished viola de gamba player, Claudio Monteverdi, was also about to change the history of music in his own way. Monteverdi was working at the court of Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga of Mantua, and had been for the last six years. He had had the best musical education, being a student of the wonderful Marcantonio Ingegneri, the choir master, at the cathedral in Cremona, and was amazing people with his magicals and other compositions. And so when the current maestro di Capella at the Manchurian court named Gesch de Wert, he was Flemish, died in 1596, the same year Niccolo Amati was born. Monteverdi just knew he really, 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 really wanted that job. The new head of the strings department at the Mantuan court was his. It also paid really, really well. But did he get it? No. Who do you think did? It was Benedetto Pallavicino, the other guy from Cremona. That's who. Okay, so he was like 17 years older than Monteverdi and in cahoots with the now dead Wert, the old head of the music department, But who was better? Well, Claudio obviously thought he was, and now he had to pretend that this totally didn't bother him, but his time would come. In an age when even royalty can drop dead of an ear infection, only five years later, Pallavicino died of a fever. Yes. Monteverdi lost no time scratching off a letter to the Duke. He wrote to him sending his CV via a long-winded letter that went something like blah 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 and finally the world having seen me persevere in the service of your excellency with my great eagerness and with the goodwill on your part after the death of the famous Mr. Strigio and after that the excellent Mr. Geish and again for a third time after that the excellent Mr. Franceschi and no and again, lastly, after the death of the nearly adequate Signor Benedetto Pallavicino, and I, who have sought not on the basis of merit, but on the grounds of the faithful and outstanding devotion that I have always displayed in my services of your excellency, the post now vacant in this sacred art. That was one sentence. This was an important CV, as you will see. Because only a few years later, the most excellent Francesco Gonzaga would ask Monteverdi to write what would soon become a smash hit piece of music, an opera. At the same time, I would have a good think about this job that appears to have an alarmingly high mortality rate. Dr. Emily Brayshaw, fashion historian. Um, so you were talking about um, 15, 1607 and Orfeo. Yes. Um, so this is in the Mantua Gonzaga court. And what's interesting with this court is that even though they were, they were very heavily aligned with the Habsburgs. And so essentially the Gonzagas of Mantua, they were kind of only minor players in Europe. And so what these might, so they were in like northern Italy and what these minor players had to do was 
essentially like really depend on big allies and relatives and to bolster their reputation and to protect their borders. And so they kind of aligned themselves with the Habsburgs and um, in turn they had to show loyalty to the Habsburgs. Um, but they couldn't really afford big armies. So what they did, they did it with cultural production and they spent all their money through cultural production. And we see this in November 1598. And this kind of is almost like the forerunner for these operas of Monteverdi. And so Margaret of Austria, who's the Queen of Spain, and so she was like a Habsburg a Habsburg Margaret of Austria. She was married to become the Queen of Spain. She passed through Mantua on for a five-day stay on her way to Spain in November 1598. She was 14 years old and off to Spain to get married. Um, and Duke Vincenzo of Gonzaga arranged for five days of festivities and amusements. And this included a very elaborate performance of Battista Gurani's pastoral play Il Pasto Fido in the Castle Theatre. And he wanted to, the, the Duke Vincenzo wanted to show that um, Mantua was as magnificent as any other court, but he did that through staging these spectacles. And uh, we've got accounts of the time. These were just amazing, um, apparently. And it wasn't too far from Cremona, right? So you'd get no, your, exactly, exactly. Your instruments would have. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, depending where the best ones are, and so we know that um, you know he had also their court. Um, you know, by sixteen oh seven. 800 people, um, including writers, artists, musicians, and even a troupe of Commedia dell'arte actors, enjoyed Gonzaga patronage. They were also patrons of the Flemish artists, Peter Paul Rubens. And so these, you know, spectacles held sort of 10 years earlier. You and, know, and Monteverdi. Yeah, and Mon- yeah, Monteverdi is definitely one of these patrons. Mm. Yeah, definitely. These lavish costumes. And that's the thing with these Medici costumes as well and then the Monteverdi costumes for these. They're being designed to appeal to contemporary tastes. And so to give you sort of a sense of these spectacles, the play for um, Maria of Austria, this big um, costume, you know, music drama, it's got more than 80 different ones in rich fabrics and colours and that was used for the inaugurant inaugural performance of Teatro Olimpico and um, in portraits of the era and the shoulders are, um, we can see in these portraits, the neckline sits right down around the upper forearms. It's particularly like an off-the-shoulder type dress. Yeah, yeah. Um, here we've got this here in a... Um, Mary Princess Royal portrait and we've got like this really low down cut down and it would have been very very difficult to raise your arms and your elbows would have been um, you know set right down and we see this a lot in like the Peter Lely portraits yes so there's a lovely portrait of a woman playing a gamba that we sort of see with that and she's got one of these gowns on A bit of talk about menswear. So this is like a lot of cloth with gold and silver embroidery. And again, that's sort of like a rich flex. Shoes by that period, we're getting like high-heeled shoes. And we're starting to see, um, even before that, in the um, 1600s now, moving forward in that decade, the farthingale, what's happening with the farthingale is the hems are rising. So we're getting these high-heeled shoes for the first time with reds red uh, heels and um, square toes. But yeah, these sloping shoulders that we're seeing in the 1650s would have contributed to that, you know, the elbows being kept closer to the body, you know, keeping your body front on the instrument being held lower against the layers of fabric and then playing like that, being everything being held close in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they get that, yeah, the classic gamber playing posture would yeah. have worked but oh would have worked perfectly but the, having to stick your 
elbows out or lift an instrument high just wouldn't have worked. No, no. So that's why the instruments, you know, we do still have pictures of violins being played quite low and held quite low. Although Niccolò Amati would have the good fortune to survive plague, pestilence, war and disease, his life would not have been an easy one. He grew up in a particularly turbulent time, even for Cremonese standards. In the marketplace, Girolamo would have participated in discussions about the state of the city. And the Spanish governor, Juan Fernández de Valesco, stated the need to fortify the city's walls, noting that the citizens were numerous and warlike. And if anyone needed a defence wall, they did. Well, if they needed fixing, which they obviously did, who was going to do it? The city's defences and other repair and maintenance appears to have been an ongoing discussion with no one really wanting to fit the bill for the works needed inside the city walls. But as time would tell, the state of the city's walls would be the least of their problems in the years to come. The Amati household would have definitely been a loud one, with ten children of varying ages, six girls and four boys. There was Niccolò's eldest half-sister, Elizabeth, who was about 14 years older than him. His oldest brother, Roberto, who was nine years older than him, had joined the army. His second eldest brother was training to join the clergy, and his parents were probably encouraging some of his sisters to do the same, as dowries for six girls were not going to be easy to come by. He also had a little brother who died as a small child and another younger brother, Stefano, that we know nothing about. All we know for sure is that Niccolo would help his father making instruments and soon would come to be his right-hand man. In 1607, Niccolo would have been 11 and most likely helping out his father in the workshop. The Amati family still had their fine reputation and Girolamo had an order for a tenor viola for Pope Paul V. The painted decorations on the back would be done by a local artist and then returned to the workshop for its final coat of varnish before being sent off. Today this viola has been reduced and the painted griffin on the centre of the instrument has been modified somewhat. I think someone tried to fix it up but it looks like a damp bunyip in between two cherubs unfortunately. But business was good in these years. Quite a number of instruments left the workshop and a variety of violins of various sizes. Violas and bass instruments were produced. They were at the centre of musical life in Cremona. The workshop had a steady flow of musicians, music dealers, church musicians, clergy and messengers representing the nobility, so that they would have had news early on about the new opera coming to have its debut in town. What is amazing in Renaissance Italy is that artistically the area was a shining star, even though politically and economically it was in a free fall. Areas poverty-stricken and ravaged by war and heavy taxation. And yet there were amazing motets, madrigals and operas emerging from all of this. Emily Brayshaw. So Orfeo uh, and, and these spectacles in the Mantuan court, the use of the area in front of the stage was also used performance and there was also an active involvement of the audience And this kind of sought a new balance, scholars have said, in order to connect this fluid continuum of stage and auditorial. And it was kind of this representation of openness peculiar to courtly circles. So, you know, sometimes musicians would have been on the stage or perhaps in front of the stage or don't know that necessarily there was a separate pit all the time. Yeah. Or, you know, fluid sort of. Yeah, yeah, you know, whether they're sort of coming out and playing and then going away, or whether they're coming out on stage performing while some people sing, and then there are sort of lots of different things that they could be doing. And the Orfeo actually came to Cremona. Uh, Girolamo had just had his sixth child, which was Niccolo. Uh-huh. Uh, Marty. And so he would have been a baby. He would have been about what, about two when yeah. this had happened. And they'd actually staged this in Cremona. So I could imagine there might have been like a, a troupe with the going with them. It could have been local musicians. Um, yeah. So this is something that it, potentially the Amati family could have gone to and seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, look. And, you know, if you are making and playing and very much involved in 
this world, part of keeping up to date is to watch performances, look at performances, keeps you up to date on trends, tips, techniques, styles, aesthetics. All of these things are, you know, really crucial to not just like keeping abreast of your skills, but also in a way, you know, the Amatis are part of the tastemakers of this era with their incredible instruments. They're setting quite literally the tone. Yeah. And so seeing and hearing how these instruments are then used and engaged with. Yeah, because the uh, Charles IX instruments, they were made uh, when Catherine and Charles did their grand tour. Right. But I'm, I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if those same instruments were used uh, years later in the Ballet Comique de la Reine because they were, you know, they fitted in with all the bling that were covered with gold and decorations and it, that was... Um, and they were this beautiful, this beautiful consort of instruments that the royal family had. So, and that, that's the thing too. Like you don't just chuck it away. All anyone could talk about in musical circles was Cremona's very own Claudio Monteverdi's opera. It was supposed to be an amazing spectacle, mixing singing, dancing, and drama. Moving on a few years, as Niccolo was helping his father in the workshop after school. The world of music was being rethought, where once it was being used to convey the omnipotence of God, his creativity and power. Composers were now using it to convey the human mind and emotions to feel love, rage, jealousy and passion. Shakespeare was writing plays in England, drawing on classical drama and using Greek and Roman plots to recreate political commentaries of the day. In France, it was ballet and in Italy, it was opera. It all started in Florence, where a group who called themselves the Camerata met. They were poets, composers, artists, scientists and philosophers. It was another one of those academies I spoke about earlier. They wanted to recreate ancient Greek theatre and they believed it was done through song, not the spoken word. The group would meet to discuss what the music of the Greeks would have been and delved into conversations about astrology, literature, philosophy and, of course, singing. One of the members was Vincenzo Galilei, father of the Galileo Galilei. After years of talking about it, they finally decided to do it. They would create the ultimate art form that would combine music, poetry, drama, dance and design. Things got off to an awkward start in 1600 when they staged a very heavy and somewhat depressing production at a wedding. It was Eurydice's, totally not reading the room, with themes of doomed love and man's arrogance, they were not feeling the vibe at this raucous wedding feast, so that sort of deadpanned. But things really took off when the philandering, hardcore gambling and sometimes murderous Vincenzo Gonzaga, over in Mantua, decided he would like one of these new opera thingies of his own. But the music this time would be written by a young man working at his court, Claudio Monteverdi, a talented composer from Cremona. This opera was called Orfeo, and like that, Poof! Opera took off. Fifteen years earlier, the younger Monteverdi had come to the Mantuan court to work for the Gonzagas. Every Friday evening, there would be a musical soiree. Monteverdi would write and perform magicals, and they would be performed in private concerts above the Duke's own rooms, in a mirrored trapezoidal room. Their reflections would have been reflected into infinity. It must have been psychedelic. When Monteverdi wrote the opera, he wrote about human emotions, drama and passion. It was an immediate success after being performed at the Gonzaga court. It went to Cremona, Turin, Florence and Milan. To accompany the singers, Monteverdi had an ensemble of instruments, a harpsichord, a chamber organ, cello, viola da gamba, harp and different types of lutes. Normally, you would just pick one or two of these instruments, but Monteverdi used all of them. Way to go, Claudio. So here we are in Cremona at the end of the 1500s. The Amati family are in the midst of musically exciting times, and Niccolo is a young boy growing up destined for great things as well. And this brings us to the end of this episode on the Amati brothers. But stay tuned for the next one as I talk to Timo Vecchio Val and he tells me all about the fascinating history of the Amati brothers' cello he plays on. It's a very cool story. 
James Bond is involved. This brings us to the end of this Amati Brothers episode. In the next, I will still be talking about Girolamo and his work, but also introducing Niccolo, his son, perhaps the most well-known of the Amatis. The father and son's lives and careers overlap, and so do their episodes. I finished this story in the late 1500s, and just a few kilometres away, in Brescia, Giopaolo Magini is living and working at the same time as Niccolo, and will be hit with similar catastrophes. So very soon I will be going sideways and leaving Cremona and the Amati story to fill you in on the Brescia makers before coming back to finish the Amati dynasty. Thank you very much for listening to this episode and I hope you'll join me next time for the Violin Chronicles. Right now you're listening to a live recording of the Australian Chamber Orchestra playing Boccherini. If you would like to support the podcast, please head over to patreon.com forward slash The Violin Chronicles and do that. It would be wonderful to have your support. And you will also have access to bonus episodes and the All You Need to Know podcast where we go through each maker and quickly detail their life and do a rundown of the characteristics in their instruments and how to recognize an instrument from each maker. Do subscribe to the podcast or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to follow on Instagram, the handle is at The Violin Chronicles. Until next time, goodbye.